we have a bit of a different episode coming to you this week that will not feature our usual banter or focus on current baseball events. We'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming next week, but we wanted to take this time to dive into something that is near and dear to both of our hearts and is something that might be familiar to a lot of our younger listeners as well. A few months ago, Zach Kramer of The Ringer wrote an article titled How Backyard Baseball Became a Cult Classic. The article took a look back on the game as it approached its 20th anniversary. We both read it. I feel old, by the way, saying that. We both read it. We both loved it. And it's safe to say from that point on, we were on our own personal odyssey to find a way to play it again. Yeah, I can't tell you the number of just childhood memories that I have playing this game on friends' computers, on my computer. Um, Putting is, way too much time into this game. Yeah, it's, but it's a lot of fun, and I have a lot of memories of it. So, after I rummaged through my house in Philly and found every backyard game besides backyard baseball, which was infuriating, I found backyard soccer, backyard football. <laughs> um, you took a deep dive and are now an expert on running <laughs> Windows 98 on a MacBook Air. <laughs> and alas, we got our chance to relive our childhood. Yeah, it was a lot of work, but I did it. We got it up and running. And if you're listening to this and you would like to play along as you listen to this episode, you can go to tippingpitches.atavis.com and we'll have a little how-to where you can find out how to play it on your own personal computing device. (laughs) And of course, we'll link to that in the description. Yes. So if we lost you at Backyard Baseball and Cult Classic, let's rewind for a second. Backyard Baseball is a computer game developed by Humongous Entertainment a company that primarily made its hay selling educational adventure games for kids in the early to mid-90s. One of Humongous' main calling cards, as we'll hear a little bit later, was that all of its games were point-and-click, something that made it easy for kids to get the hang of. The original game featured 30 fictional characters complete with personalities, intro songs, different skill sets, and different backgrounds. Later versions gained popularity in large part due to them adding kid versions of some of baseball's biggest stars like Ken Griffey Jr. Ken Griffey Jr. steps up. What out? Alex Rodriguez. Hi, I'm Alex. Alex Rodriguez. Basically a player from every team. Uh, but the original game managed to capture kids' attention by mimicking a wiffle ball game with the neighborhood kids. We wanted to recapture that and in doing so, seek to figure out what made this game so irreplaceable in the hearts of the up and coming baseball generation, you know, yourself, myself, all of our friends, basically, all of my friends played this game on my little league team. So later in the episode, we'll talk to the original creator of the game, a guy named Nick Markovich, who was awesome, really nice, really fun. Can't thank him enough for helping us out with this. But before we do that, I think a trip down memory lane is in order. I'm Bobby Wagner. And I'm Alex Baisley. And this is a special themed edition of Tipping Pitches. Oh, that yeah. time again. Time I for forgot some about the announcement. Fun. I'm Sunny Day, and together with my pal Vinny the Gooch, we'll bring <laughs> Sunny Day and Vinny the Gooch. <laughs> oh, that might be Loki the best part. Yeah. Honestly, I'll take them over Joe Buck. Way too much cotton candy True. today, so that you're not hungry at dinner time tonight. Your parents will think it's the funniest thing since your last report card. What is so he talking let's about? Get on with the ball game. <laughs> He's just going. I think it's sort of hard to overstate just how much this game meant to us, like when we were kids, and just how much time we put into playing this game. I remember just sitting in front of the computer for hours, and my mom being like, dinner, like, you gotta do your homework, that kind of stuff. And just not wanting to stop playing this game because the the method of the game is that you can start you know a season with a team and go throughout and then play in the playoffs with that same team and win the world series with that team and crazy competitive young me who was just starting to play little league was like this is amazing i can do this with my team in little league and i could come home and do it with my team on backyard baseball so this is really like the first thing the first kind of game where i had like a long storyline that i could follow up with and that was like the genesis of my personal connection with it. Um, and what I remember the most is just putting together a team, whether it be the Mets or, you know, another team, or you could kind of create your own team with wonky names and stuff. 
going back to the 97 version. Yeah, it was something that I think it was really easy to forge a relationship with. And we'll and we'll go into this a little bit more later on in the episode about the players that we really liked and just kind of how friendly they all seemed. And But it's something about recreating that idea of the backyard spirit, right? I mean, it's very idealized among all young kids growing up playing baseball is a, a game of wiffle ball in the backyard and getting together with kids from around the neighborhood or even just like your your brother or sister or something like that and and the fact that this game was able to kind of take that whole spirit and I mean I suppose you could you could on the one hand be like well they're taking the spirit and they're putting it onto a screen <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the cynical look at it but it was kind of striking how much you kind of did start to forge relationships with these players and and it was accessible to everyone no matter where you were or kind of or what you were doing what your personal situation was Um, you didn't have to have a bat or you didn't have to have eight friends from around the neighborhood to to pick up a game and start playing and uh, that was really impressive to me Here's Nick Murkovich, the creator and a co-designer of the game. I am a brother um, with, I have four other brothers. So we're a family of five boys um, and we were in a military family. We moved around a lot. Um, So playing outside sports and outside games was a big deal. Mom would always kick us out, right? So we would collect people from the neighborhood and we would play games. And, And that was what I remember as a kid doing a lot of um playing baseball with your friends um just building making teams um you know using the ghost runners and all-time pitchers and and all the different uh rules that we would come up with and it was just fun um and so that that i remembered a lot um bad bad news bears of course was a really big hit um for me as a kid i loved that movie all of them actually which is probably sad um the (laughs) Like some of those later ones were hard to watch now, but back then I, I loved them. <laughs> um, and so that was that was definitely a part of it as well. Um, but the real kind of how I, I thought about and how I created it, um, I was working on, we made adventure games there at Humongous. It was just adventure games for kids, which it was a really good niche. And I really liked doing that, but... I wanted to do something that I wanted to play more. You know, I, I mm-hmm. wanted to play a game. And I played a lot of uh, baseball games on NES and all of the different consoles because we had them all at, at, at our house. Um, so baseball was a – was it seemed to me the easiest one to do. It's a station-to-station type of game. It seemed – when I thought about it, it seemed – uh, easy, but obviously once I talked to the, the programmers, um, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was. <laughs> but so that that was the pitch was like, okay, let's make something with kids getting together and playing baseball. And um, I I had a my initial idea was a lot more like story based, a lot more like a season in the life of a neighborhood kids, kind of more like a Sandlot type story mm-hmm. um where you they're, they're collecting these kids and th- maybe some kid moves into the neighborhood midway through the season um somebody else uh has to do um piano lessons and can't go to the games and yeah and so like that would happen throughout the um the season that was kind of my the, what i was really thinking how it would work and then in between your actions your wins and your losses would affect how that story played out and you could play it multiple times and it would have different stories and stuff like that. So it was probably overcomplicated, you know, as far as what I, I envisioned. And then basically I, I came, went to work, I pitched it um, to a, I, I showed it actually to Rich Mo, um, who, who was a programmer there. And I said, Hey, would this be a game? Do you think? And he kind of helped me uh, consolidate the pitch into a, like a one pager and uh, I presented it to Ron Gilbert, who was the head of Humongous, programming god, um, Ron, Ron Gilbert. <laughs> um, yeah, he's a, he's a design god. Uh, he's one of the one of the big ones. And so I, I went to him and I said, "Hey, this is an this could be interesting. Why? What, what do you think?" And he 
I think he was a little bit, he's like, oh, I'll look at it. We'll see. We're doing what we're doing. We, we have a, a trajectory. Things are going this way. Um, and then out of nowhere, really, a couple months later, all of a sudden it was going. It was like, it's on, Nick. You know, we're doing this. The Rich came over to my office when I got there. It's like, we're doing backyard baseball. We're talking about it right now. You know, come on into this office, you know. And um, and I think what happened was the Mariners started doing good. Pitch to Edgar Martinez now. And a fastball swung on and hit the deep center field. Bernie Williams goes back and it is. Get out the right bread and the mustard this time, Grandma. It is a grand salami. And the Mariners lead it 10-6. to six. And Ron just kind of got into the fever of baseball and so from that and that and that's just me conjecture I, I think that that's how what happened but um all of a sudden it was on the table and we're making it i just happened to be working on another project at the time i was working on um putt putt um travels through time which was a, a adventure game for kids we we're deep into it it was a huge game um it was my first lead so I didn't really want to leave it, but I didn't want to give it my, my game away either. And luckily, um, they gave it to Rich Mo and Mark Pizer, and um, I shared an office with Mark. So I got to hear all their conversations. I chirped in whenever I could. Um, when I finally finished our game, I was able to jump onto there, do some animations, and, and definitely help with the gameplay and uh, help with some of the designs on that side. of how, just Because how, they didn't play baseball games. I was the kind of conduit for that. Rich and Mark, though, I think that made it even better because they were coming from it at a different angle. And they, they were really thinking more really about the kids, the characters and how they play. And, their, and, and they put in a lot of their memories of playing sports. My memories was I wasn't a horrible baseball player. I, was, I wasn't the best, but I wouldn't be picked last. And I think that... <laughs> There was a lot more of this, you know, uh, there's an, uh, different levels of how p people play. You know, there, there's certain play players that are really, 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 really good. And then there are players that aren't. And they definitely put that in there. I was, I probably, if it was me, I probably would have not have had as many bad players on the team, on the thing. <laughs> um, but once that was kind of in there, it felt more real, actually, you know, and, uh, and we kind of kept that uh, throughout all of the uh, incarnations of baseball. For all the talk about the conception of the idea, what really made the game pop from the first pitch was its list of diverse characters. How much time went into developing these characters, from the mannerisms to the original songs, each kid felt like someone who could have lived next door, but also, making sure that people of all backgrounds are represented. There's 15 boys, 15 girls in the original game of all different um, shapes, sizes, skin colors, backgrounds. And I think that was really cool. That was something I didn't really notice at the time playing. I mean, what, like, I was like a seven-year-old kid. It's not something I paid attention to, but I think that's something that resonates with people still today, and it's why it made it easy, so easy to really forge those personal connections with the characters. And the level of detail that went into all of these players and the different stadiums that you can play in and just how they chose to to use things like a like a balloon for a base or stuff like that just sitting out there or a glove for a base it really felt like the people who made this game had played a ton of just pick up baseball around the neighborhood when they were growing up just to expand on the diversity point for a second it would have been very easy for them. To, I mean, you know, like you said, you had 15 boys and 15 girls, and it would have been very easy to just throw in a few black kids or any random stereotypical, like, Asian character. But it, there was a lot of detail put into, like, different skin tones. And you had a, a kid in a wheelchair. And especially for something like 1997, you know, we talk a lot about representational politics, but I think that there's something to be said for seeing, actually seeing yourself in a video game, right? And so that idea of accessibility to everyone and not just having it be this kind of um, monotone, like, 
mostly white game, uh, mostly guys, because, I mean, we know that, like, you can look at the demographics of the MLB today, like, we've talked about that a lot, um, but this idea that, like, this is something for everyone, that was really, I think, looking back on it, made it really special and unique for the time. And I think something that was so important to that was that Humongous Entertainment was not a a sports video game company, right? It started out as an educational adventure style company that, that built games for little kids who, you know, wanted to learn while playing games on the computer. They had a purpose. And I think that when they developed this game, they brought that same ethos of representation of education. And this game, while it's not educating you in, I don't know, math or science or anything like that, it's sort of educating you in, camaraderie and being part of a team and i know that sounds sort of weird to say you know if you're playing a game by yourself on the computer but at least it's better than not doing those things at least it's better than not representing different types of people and uh and having a positive attitude in a video game for little kids you know so many video games don't have that so if kids are going to be playing a video game i would much rather than be playing a game like this where it's taking an honest look at who likes baseball anyone can like baseball that was the whole ethos of this game anyone can and should love baseball and be allowed to do that here's nick again on the importance of education diversity and character individuality we know we weren't really teaching but we always kind of thought about the fact that we're teaching kids things you know or we're, we're showing them baseball how it's actually played um for the most part i think get them to understand these things because i think that there was a point when i was a kid where i i didn't know how many bases were on a on a uh, baseball field you know it's just i didn't know that, that that's it's three with a with a home plate it's like maybe maybe there's six i don't know you know <laughs> and and you know why 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 do they walk on four balls you know and all these things like but once you start learning all these little concepts it's like you can watch it now and you can understand a lot of this stuff and that was pretty cool we wait the company that we work for it was a kids company and we really were thinking about how um offensive we didn't want to offend anybody we wanted to be as inclusive as possible and we um and one of the things that uh, rich and mark did right off the bat was just say okay we're gonna make half boys half girls so that was the first thing that they, they thought of and then then it was like okay well we're gonna basically pepper this and season the whole entire thing with all as, as many different uh races if, you know ethnicities everything as we what we can and it, to fit into the the, the 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 side the boy and the girl side and um and i think they did that really really well um rich wrote a lot of these characters some of them are based on kids that he knew. Some are based, I think, maybe even on us and uh, people that worked at the at the company. Um, the twins at the Webbers. I'm going to crush this one. I'm going to smash the ball out of here. His wife is Ashley and Sydney is his tw- or her twin sister. So, I mean, they were he incorporated a lot of uh, people that he knew. But mostly it was really trying to, to spread it all out. And, and make people interesting in, in all their own ways. I think Reese um, was probably rich. I'm Reese Worthington. I am totally not a nerd. He, he's, he had the asthma and he was a little uh, shorter, but he, he tried really hard, you know? And, and if you ever meet Rich, funniest guy ever. So, <laughs> um, and so they, they would write all these things down. I think that was really good. And obviously everybody had their own personality. We, from the the things that they they yell in the field, you know, their their, their banter and their chatter. All unique. Um, we added the, the the idea that maybe if you you can click on them on their portrait and they would just talk to you. Um, and then the, the more you click on them, the more they tell you about Hello. themselves. I am Maria Luna. My cat Larue couldn't be here today. He is recovering from a bad case of worms, but I will try to do my best without him. And and they might even give you um, special hints about them um, because we also have this thing in there where if you put two specific players together, either on the team or against each other, or there could be some other um, factor, um, they become better or worse. So like... Uh, like if the twins were together, they would play better, both of them. 
would would be better. That would, they were always my middle infield, and because they they were just they were we they were they knew they were going to do good, and um and they were great together. Um, like uh I think the Del Vecchios, they um Angela and Tony. Hey there, short stuff. I'm Angela, Angela Del Vecchio. I'm Tony's little sister. name's Del Vecchio, but you can just call me Del Vec. You know, Del Vecchio. Del Vec. Capiche? They would play, Angela would always play great if he was, she was playing against Tony, but if Tony's playing against her, Tony would play worse. Um, and so, like, they would have, like, some interactions that, um, what actually, I think, kind of did happen when we were kids, you know, you, um, you want to show your your older brother up or um you uh you're embarrassed that your younger sister is playing with you you know yeah um so there was something there and i thought that was cool and then there's the silly things like dimitri he was like the kind of bigger guy with glasses greetings comrade i am dimitri petrovich he would play he was really a sciencey guy and he for some reason he would do really well on artificial surfaces you know just something silly like that um and and you might be able to pick up on it in the dialogue but uh hopefully we never really like pointed it out yeah i think uh, i think what struck me upon like coming back to it and playing it after not having played it for a while was just like the the depth of that and like how definitely at one point in my life i knew all of these things and i knew like oh you want these two in the in the middle infield but uh-huh. I had forgotten it all. And then also you had mentioned uh, when they, so when they talk to you, when you open the player card up and then Uh if you don't choose them on your team, they, they all have like a different opinion about that. Like some of them will get mad. Some of them will get (laughs) sad. And I remember Alex and I reacting to that, just being like, Oh, I didn't like mean to offend them. (laughs) I think, I think that like speaks to the fact that they, they do have personality. Hi, my name's Kimmy, and I like candy. Oh, she's not that good. She's aight. She's aight. She's aight. <laughs> all right no. now, Kimmy. <laughs> you must not want to win. The amount of effort they put into cultivating these personalities that really made it easy to find some common ground with these players and and relate to them in a way that other video games at the time just didn't have, right? I mean, other video games, you might not even have a team, right? You're just wearing like a nameless hat and you don't get to talk to the players at all. But all these players had their own kind of one-liners and little quirks that they would do when they uh, struck out or or you you do or don't pick them, right? It was something that made it uh, very relatable to, like, the vast array of personas you might find in any group of young kids. Yeah, and it was way ahead of its time in that sense, in terms of giving the players its personality, their personalities. And in in a lot of ways, breaking the fourth wall with a video game, which was something that you didn't really see that much at that time, where the players are looking straight at you, and you hover over them, and they're talking to you. You know, that's a very... That's a different thing. You don't see that a lot. And in in video games now, even, you don't see that a ton. It's just kind of characters on a screen. It's been sort of a more recent thing where it's a first person thing where the player is talking straight at you, the, 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 uh, where the character in the game is talking straight at you, the player of the game. But in the way that Backyard Baseball was ahead of its time with its character development, I think it came at the perfect time in terms of just the overall general, uh, landscape of video games. Meaning, you know, it was 1997, so a lot of what we love about video games now, or, or a lot of what, if you play video games, what you'd probably love about baseball video games now is how ridiculously realistic they are. You know, MLB The Show, it doesn't really look that different from watching a game on TV, if we're being honest. With some of the graphics and the, the game design nowadays, it's really like throwing yourself into being part of an MLB team or a GM or whatever it might be. But back then, they didn't really have those kind of graphics, so when you are playing it, it felt like boxy and weird. But Backyard Baseball 97 and and then later 2001 was still right in that sweet spot where video games were popular because, you know, Madden had come out in 1988 and really got popular around 1990. And so it had almost a decade to really gain popularity, gain the popularity of sports video games. So Backyard Baseball came out and it was like, we're going to be a different game entirely. We're going to be a point and click game and we're going to have the personalities are going to be the things you care about not trying to imitate like you're playing a real sport necessarily, but still doing a pretty good job of that, honestly. But not trying to pretend that it was like you were out there for real. You were really immersing yourself in kind of this cartoon world, which I personally loved because it reminded me a lot of the baseball movies that I loved growing up, like Sandlot. Hey, you want some more? Some more what? 
Okay. No, 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 you want a s'more. Uh, I haven't had anything yet. So how can I have some more of nothing? Shut up! You're killing me, Smalls. And bad news bears. What? There's chocolate all over this ball. Look, Mr. Buttermaker, quit bugging me about my food. People are always bugging me about it. My shrink says that's why I'm so fat. So you're not doing me any good, so let's quit it. And Little Big League and that kind of stuff. Still doing your homework? Yeah. You know, we got a relatively big game today, kid. Yeah, well, I got a relatively big math tutor. Can't have this hanging over my head. Yeah, it's kind of funny because in a certain way, it, in, in a kind of backwards way, because it was so goofy and unrealistic, that's what made it so much easier to connect with because it was not trying to put on this veneer of like looking like the real thing because as you mentioned just due to the you know lack of technological advances at that time the stuff that tried to look realistic just did not and you looked at it and you were like well this isn't realistic you looked at backyard baseball and you're like it's not necessarily trying to be realistic right it's trying to create this whole it's trying to exist in a completely different world and in that sense um, I think that that was really it was fun to play with The version that we've mostly been talking about up to this point is the first version created, Backyard Baseball 1997. But as two kids born in 1996, the versions we played most were the later ones, 2001 and 2003 primarily. A key distinction between the two? Professional players. In 2001, Backyard licensed the rights from MLB to use players in their likenesses, but that came with a trademark Backyard twist. They drew all the characters to fit right in with the rest of the kids, so it didn't break from the foundation that the original group of 30 kids had set. Here's Nick again on the struggles and rewards that came with adding in real-life superstars. Football was the first time we used pros. We, we did a soccer game afterwards, after, after this. That was my first lead was uh, on the sports titles was the soccer game. Um, and then we did uh, football. We ended up getting a, a marketing guy um, at the company and uh he knew somebody and he just kind of set it up and, um, and football happened. And we, as people on the teams, we were, we didn't really like it. We th thought that the, the kids could carry it. You know, our kids are good enough. We don't need to put this in there, but then football, it worked out pretty well. It, it, they, we were able to make the characters. They were a small amount though, a lot less than what we did in baseball. Um, but then once we started baseball, baseball 2001 they said hey we're gonna go to mlb we we want to do we want they they said that we can put their logos in the game um and uh and have some players and it's like so what what do we want and um it was really hard to say no you know it's like okay well then we've got 30 kids and there's about there's at the time i think there was like 30 baseball teams it's like i guess we get it, one from every team and, uh, and and kind of like how the All Star Game kind of does a mm -hmm. little bit, right? So it's like, yeah, let's do this. Well, we, we can we can find um, a good player on every team to make sure everybody's represented. Um, and uh, but we you know we overrepresented maybe the Mariners a little bit, and also uh, the Reds ended up getting two players because uh, Ken Griffey had, went to the Reds that year, and he was going to be in our game. So um, which is kind of funny because Alex. Rodriguez wouldn't have been in the game. So Alex got, shows up, and uh, then also um, Barry Larkin has a friend. I feel know. like that was almost a was almost a fortunate turn of events because, one, Ken Griffey is, is perfect for this game, just with the backwards yes. hat and, like, the kid, obviously. Yep. And then Alex Rodriguez, who just has, like, he was young, very young at the time, but also has, like, an eternally youthful face and, like, was still an up-and-coming young star at the time. So I feel like that worked yep. out in, in the game yep. in everybody's favor. It did, um, but we didn't want to get rid of Barry Larkin. I mean, that guy's amazing. So, <laughs> um, so we that was really fun picking the kid, the the players. You know, which which who do we want, and some hemming and hawing about that. But as far as the Major League Baseball, I don't think they they didn't put any. They, once they saw our list, they said yes, that's fine. You know, there wasn't any. You know, you should probably put this person in or anything. They just let us go. I think they were more worried about the colors of their um, teams being changed than that. So 
but yeah, putting them in there, trying to set put them in there and make sure that they don't just overshadow our kids was tough. And I think that some of our kids that were kind of the, on the, the, the sides of the bleachers, you know, they probably didn't get played all that much anymore. So we had to put some design things in there to kind of force your hand at that. And so we would not put everybody on the bench at when you're picking teams, you know, just we would collect just randomly put thing people together. Um, so you wouldn't be able to pick that special team that you love every time. Sometimes you might have to put uh, Kenny Cowie Gucci on your team or Stephanie um, to, to fill out a, a roster. I thought that worked out really good. The thing about this game is that I related to it on such a different level because I was a kid. And even if you want to relate to MLB The Show now, you're relating because you're a fan of the team. You're not relating because you can relate to Michael Conforto. You know, you don't know what it's like to be Michael Conforto or David Wright or whatever. You're relating to the kids in Backyard Baseball 2001 because they're kids. You know, Alex Rodriguez is not like super villain on the Mariners. Or, uh, you know, Derek Jeter is not this clean-cut Yankees shortstop. They're actually portrayed as 10-year-old kids or 8-year-old kids or whatever they're supposed to be, whatever the age is supposed to be in this game. And so every player has this personality and affability, and it just feels like this is what those kids were doing when they were their age. And that's a really cool feeling, I think, because it makes you feel like someday you're going to grow up to be those players as opposed to playing with them in a, a game like MLB The Show or MLB 2K or whatever was really popular in the mid-2000s. It makes you feel like you're going to grow up to be those players as opposed to like already just imitating those players. Alex, We've made it almost a half hour into this episode without addressing the elephant in the room, and that's Pablo Sanchez. The one and only, the GOAT, the greatest player of all time. Literally. I think, I think most people would agree with that one. Pablo was the game's cheat code, Bonds level talent hidden within Altuve level size. Every product that we made, um, the people that were on the teams would really gravitate towards certain players as who they loved. And they, and obviously Pablo, we, we kind of put on a pedestal a little bit um, just because his, his attributes were really good. Um, Cause so- soccer was the second game that we made and Pablo's actual attributes translate to soccer. Okay. too, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, he's going to be a good, there's, it's, we were first thinking that we would just like have, people bubble up, you know, one sport, they will bubble up and another one would kind of fall down, but we couldn't have Pablo fall down because you can't, um, defense speed, right. And things like that. You know, he has the attributes you, you we couldn't just like not have him play well. Um, and, and so that was one of the reasons why he kept being good all the time. And plus there's always that neighborhood kid. That's just, everything comes naturally to him. And like he's good at every single sport, and he just has all of the innate skills, and I feel like that works really well. Yeah, and also he's he's um, not a showboat. Very, you know, he's very quiet. Obviously, in in the in the way we, we portray him, um, he he does. He's not in your face, um, and he's tiny, easy to. I don't know. I, you could see that. Yeah, I could hang out with this little kid. You know, or 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 he can hang out with me and uh, not say anything and just hang out with me. You know, he, he seemed like he's one of those kind of kids. Yeah, he's a, um, he's a very unassuming character. You would not you would not exactly, peg him to be exactly. the best at this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. me, meanwhile, yeah. as soon as we opened up the game, we were like, "Got to get him in the three slot. Got to get him in there." <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and as far as like the animations and stuff for him, um, I I did do most of his animations, so I'm sorry about some of that um but he was kind of based on edgar martinez as far as like um like batting and how he how he swung um and uh, his stance and stuff um but not like i couldn't just emulate uh edgar but um (laughs) but basically that's that's who i based him on i think um over time he might have been you know based on other other players but um for me that's that's where i started from um and uh 
but yeah, it's it's just the unassumingness of him really was appealing. The the fact that we uh, made him uh, speak Spanish only was uh, kind of fun too. But you know, there's the secret if you you push shift and you clicked on him, he'll say something in English. Okay, don't tell the other kids, but uh, I speak English. I learned Spanish in school. But for the most part, we we, we tried to just make him this this unassuming kid. Um, but he did end up slotting in as the best kid, the best best player. Not so secret Alfred weapon, right? Sanchez stepped in. Are you a space boy? Something that I think that we need to talk about with Pablo is that he's non-conventional in basically every way. He doesn't talk. He doesn't talk trash as that kid in your neighborhood probably did and said, I'm better than you at every single sport. He's smaller. His head is bigger than the rest of his body. And his hat is, he was made sort of to be kind of cartoonish in a way. And he turned out to be this beloved figure. And they thought that they were going to make him into a secret weapon. But it turned out everyone determined that he was the best player right away. And everyone who played this game knew that Pablo would just basically hit a home run every time he came up which I think is awesome. Also, the thing we, th- we didn't mention yet is that he doesn't speak English, which is a really important thing for diversity too because Major League Baseball, you and I have said many times on this podcast that Spanish speaking is very important to Major League Baseball and baseball in general. And I think that it kind of gets papered over a lot when we talk about baseball in America. Yeah, he feels like kind of the analog to a guy like Alex Rodriguez, um, except for the fact that you know that Alex Rodriguez talked trash the entire time that he was growing up. He was not humble at all. (laughs) But yeah, it's like that idea of the unassuming character, which really, uh, there was something kind of special about that, that they didn't make him this this hulking figure. Um, I really liked that. And together with my pal, Vinny the Gooch, we'll bring every bit of the action to you. Playing in today's game are the Mighty Wombat and the Green Rocket. Fans, don't forget to eat way too much cotton candy today so that you're not hungry at dinner time tonight. Your parents will think it's the funniest thing since your last report card. So let's get on with the ball game. I feel like we'd be doing a disservice to the game if we didn't mention the two characters who narrate your journey throughout a backyard season. So there's Sunny Day, the play-by-play announcer, and Vinny the Gooch, the color guy. They both quickly became an integral part of gameplay. They were as effective as they were zany, and in going back to play this game, they felt, to me at least, as important as the actual players themselves. On the mound today is Pete Wheeler. Wheelie's a pretty good pitcher. As long as his teammates remember to turn him in the right direction before he starts. If not, he'll throw to second. The way. Well, I think the, the thing was when we, we started talking about how we were going to do that, um, Mark thought was like he wanted to have a girl do it. And somebody that was like, she didn't like, she didn't play sports, but she really liked to. Um, she wanted to be a broadcaster or something. That was that was kind of the the sunny day. What what, what sunny day is? She's she's just the professional broadcaster, right? And then you would always have these next to that person. There would always be the play, the there's the play by play, and then there's the color, right? And there would and so we brought in the gooch and and we had we had all of, the, of them. Uh, <laughs> every game had a different uh, character off to the side with her um, that. Um, uh, had some flavor. This kid has stolen so many bases. He makes Al Capone look like an angel. This one's out of here. Nowhere in this game did you really come across an adult, which felt very like rebellious almost. Even you know the announcers, Sunny Day and Vinny the Gooch, which come to me if you can find a more perfect announcing booth. Joe Buck and <laughs> Tim McCarver. Tim McCarver. I got nothing on this. I <laughs> got nothing on this. Um, but. That you know they were kids too. So whereas other video games and and the real baseball that you're watching on the TV, you're you're watching people who are in some ways experts or know a lot more than you or, or act like they know a lot more of you. These people were so much more relatable because it's like, oh, they're just kids and they say like silly, ridiculous things. Yeah, it kind of exemplified that very childlike awe of the game. And so, and there were some, you know, there were always some kids who maybe were not the best uh, hitter or the best pitcher, and they were much more comfortable 
commentating the game, right? Or the kids who would stand there on the field and uh, and love to yap and kind of talk about the game as it was going on, right? Uh, you know, swing, better, better. Oh, swing and a miss. Like, I, I love that it evokes that um, very natural feeling of, of kids who gravitate towards certain things and, and the kids who might be a know-it-all about uh, X, Y, and Z, or who just loved the the spirit of engaging with it on a on a very personal level. And something that Zach Cram wrote in his Ringer piece is that you know Sunny Day was not interested in playing. Really, she was as um, as Cram writes. Dolores Rogers recalls that Sunny was a know it all ahead of her years, and so it's like she didn't really actually want to play, but she loved the game still. And that was just something that you don't get a lot is like a, a little girl who wanted to be around the game. But didn't feign like she, you know, wanted to play. She just wanted to do this other thing, which is so cool and so representative in a way that you know reality is not. Yeah, some some kids are like, you know what? I want to be the umpire. I want to do my crazy, stupid ring them up calls, and because that's fun for me, and it it speaks to the different things that kids I think gravitate towards. So from the Zach Cram Ringer piece, my idea was that she was a huge sports fan and it was not cool, says Jen Taylor, the voice of video game heroines Cortana from Halo and Princess Peach from Mario, who received her start by voicing Sunny in baseball. That's kind of cool actually. Yeah. That like th- this game sort of launched the voices of famous <laughs> uh women in video games. This was the one place where it was cool for her to be a sports fan. She's a really fun, precocious kid. She organized those games. She put them all together. It was all on her. And her little blazer? I mean, come on. (laughs) (laughs) Backyard baseball didn't start off so hot. Sales weren't great with the first iteration, but they soon started to pick up, and over time, it developed into a definite juggernaut. But maybe even more remarkable than its initial popularity was its staying power. It remains a cult classic to this day, and for the most part, it really holds up, especially among people our age. And we wanted to know why. I think what, what first off, I think we, um, for me, it was just, we get to make a sports game. I, I'm so excited about making a sports game. I was just over the moon with that. Um, but after a while, you, you really when you start working on these games with these characters and this also for the adventure games that we worked on too, you, you really do start really liking the characters and you want them to do, do well. And you, you start thinking of what are they going to be in the future? You know, where, where are they going to, where are they going to go? And, and so, yeah, I think that we knew that we had a good group of kids and we, we knew that we can make a game that felt good and for it's fairly easy to play. We got, we, we knew we could do that. But for it to kind of keep going, um, I think that that's kind of more of a lightning in a bottle type of thing. I think uh, there's a, a little bit of luck in that. But, I mean, really the, the roadmap that we did, having a lot of different interesting characters, hopefully one of those characters are either close to you or somebody that you know or whatever, you know. Um, I think that that was kind of a nice way to or at least that was a good thing that we did. I knew that that was going to work out. And then the whole Sandlot type game, everybody has to do that. I mean, when we were all kids, we did it. I mean, we made our own fields. We played in um, uh, the street or we played on the side of our house, you know. Right. So I knew that that would resonate. And baseball obviously is one of those sports that, that does play well on a video game. And and that's half of what makes it so much fun, right? Is that is that this is something we've all played wiffle ball in our backyards, and mm-hmm. and you you know you could be playing another MLB the Show or something like that, and uh, and improve your player or play throughout the season, but you don't really get that personal identification with the player that you're uh that you're you know you might be looking for aside from you know he hits big home runs or whatever it's like it feels very right. down to earth and and accessible i think to a lot of people i'm yeah i'm also of the the, the feeling that because when i did play those um all of the, the 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 big big boy console games i kind of made up stories too you know i saw their stats increase and i'm like yeah you know he 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 slept good that last night or whatever. <laughs> I just made up stuff, you know, for myself. So even those ones back then, they were so generic and not. They didn't have a lot of character. They were just guy with this shirt on now, you know, tinted to this skin tone. Um, and you, I could still say, oh, that's little Joey Cora, 
you know, or, yeah. Oh, look at, look at Edgar. You know, I, I could, I could get into it, even though it didn't look anything close to him, but we're kind of leveraging that side of it, making these people, the kids all look different. Um, the paper animating that a lot of these were done are really, really good. Um, and then there's the, some of the stuff that I did that was probably not as good as, as, as the, some of the artists, but that I, I, I thought that that brought out so much character I mean, we had, we didn't, we had a limited animation set for these guys. Um, they had a walk up a, and a walk out, you know, um, they have a, a home run theme songs, you know, we had, uh, we had different swings and bunts and, and other kind of animations, you know, and their pitching animations. That was another one. Um, but we didn't do that much. We just let the, the game kind of do it. The attributes of the game and how the game worked how they ran around um that was all kind of kind of happy accidents would happen you know we were allowed we, we created some situations where cool funny things could happen in the field mm -hmm. um just because of attributes and uh you have the animations with the funny sound effects um it kind of works right and then yeah. just kind of uh wrapping up a bit here i know obviously the technology is very different now than it was back then, right? Like in terms yeah. of just ability in um, game design and um, mm -hmm. you know, computer processing ability, even um, yeah. how different would a backyard baseball 2018 look like, or, or even how different would that process be about going in and designing a game um, with that same ethos in 2018? Would that be for you? Oh, well, I think that if, um, yeah, it, it would be a lot different. I think it would have been a lot different. I, um, and then as we, we did end up making them in, in 3D and stuff like that, I think it kind of did lose a little bit of what we had. I think uh, if for some reason we were trying to make a 2D game, then maybe something close to this would be mm -hmm. um, what we got. Um, but I think it would end up being a, a, a 3D flashy game that had... Uh, graphics that look like uh you know fox sports and and stuff like that um and instead of it being this kind of quaint i don't know like kids trying to build build their own thing i i, I think that it, we probably wouldn't be able to do it some of the limitations that we had um i think uh made for a, a really good game um the the fact that we were making games that would fit on a a, a disc that all you had to do is plug the disc into your computer and it would play play and um, that was a mandate. It's not going to be multiple discs. And so it's like, okay, so that's going to make it smaller. Um, we're going to also uh, only want you to use one mouse click. It could work on a Mac or a PC. So one click. And it's like, ah, that's going to be hard. But we ended up coming up with some pretty interesting things. So given all this, what we've talked about, the nostalgia that is wrapped up in it and the ability for us to connect with it on a deeply personal level, you know, we're 20 years out from this game being released to the public for the first time. And you you really have a small sliver of people alive today who actually played this game and actually really connected with it on a deeply personal level. And yet at the same time, we still see a lot of talk about it. There is still this ringer piece. Um, people still tweet about it. It is really held up as kind of this bastion of childhood video games. And so what do you think? Why do you think it is that it has developed this cult following and, and still holds up today? I think it's a lot of what we already mentioned already. I and, mean, you know, without trying to sound like a broken record, it's the fact that you can relate to these characters in a way that you don't really care to relate to, like, some random character who doesn't have a name from a video game or some random alternate Mets outfielder from mid to, from the mid-2000s who's not on the team anymore. It's that you developed a personal connection to the characters of this game. And for for people like you and me, it came along right at the perfect time in my life where, like, I was old enough to really want to care about baseball and want to play and be begging my parents to let me go try out for Little League, but young enough where I was like, where I wasn't nitpicking the the fact that it was just a point and click game. You know, I wasn't wanting for more. I wanted that simplicity. I wanted to just be enveloped in the game of baseball. And the fact that it mirrors so closely a lot of baseball lore in a way, you know, like I said earlier, 
the fact that it reminds me so much of Sandlot just means that it's lumped together in my brain with the, all those things that I love so much about baseball, the childishness of baseball, and like really just the honesty of the game. You know what I mean? It's kind of interesting because neither you nor I played this game when it came out. I mean, we were not playing it as one-year-olds, right? Um, <laughs> no, I actually was. <laughs> OG, had that strong, OG backyard baseball. had that strong pointer finger at age one. <laughs> um you know, this was not something that I think really came across our radars until, I don't know, 2005, until it had kind of been out in the wild for a few years, you know, uh, when we're in elementary school. But so you have a period of maybe eight or nine years where it really, probably less than that even, where you have this generation of kids who are able to connect with it. And honestly, I think that part of it has to do with the fact that this is the generation of kids that has grown up with social media and an ability to reconnect with old things and really share that passion with other people. Um, Something that you mentioned to me before we recorded this is like Cespedes Family Barbecue and the way that they have uh, kind of kept it alive. And Zach Cram mentions that in the piece. And and, you know, we can we can all share our love for this game on a place like Twitter, right? This public forum where we can just be like, yo, remember Pablo Sanchez? That kid was wild. He was so good. And I think that that has a lot to do with the fact that it really has managed to hold up because we can share these connections with other people in a way that maybe we couldn't, you know, 10 years ago. I think that nostalgia is so huge for our generation. In an era where playing a baseball video game now basically means you're just watching a baseball game unfold in front of you and you have like a small impact on that. I think looking back on this with people who remember a time before baseball video games were exactly like that is very cool. I think it holds up for a lot of the same reasons that like a game like Mario Superstar Baseball holds up personally for me because it was weird enough and different enough and I played it with enough people that I remember doing it and I remember thinking like this is amazing this is a lot of fun but it's different enough from where the video games are now that it's like captured in time in a time capsule in a way because you won't you wouldn't see a game like this today it would be too realistic yeah that point about like nostalgia I mean maybe this is just the time where we revel and talk about backyard baseball right the people who played this are now in their early, mid-20s, going out in the world, um, facing a lot of its ills. And it's fun to look back and say, like, you know, what were the things in my childhood that, like, led me to this point? You know, my love for baseball, my engagement with the game and the players, and and looking at that kind of those formative years, uh, I think is a really present thing right now. You know, maybe in 20 years, backyard baseball is an afterthought because the kids who will, if we have anything to say about it <laughs> because maybe the ki- you know the kids who are uh, 10 or 11 now aren't playing it anymore and that's fine because they'll have their own things to look back on and so part of it is i think a really is really specific to this generation but i think it is interesting to kind of look at these cultural touchstones um along the way that really paved the way for so much love for the joy of the game yeah the joy of the game is so important in terms of why it endures because what is one of the things that we talk about most on this show is that baseball stamps that out a lot of the time real baseball stamps that out a lot of the time and conversely backyard baseball ate that up that was what backyard baseball that was the foundation of this game and so as we see young stars our age even younger coming into the league right now we hope that some of that joy starts to infect the rest of MLB in a way that the, the that backyard baseball kind of set the tone for when we were kids. You know what I mean? We're always complaining about how, you know, you can't bat flip. Well, this game was embracing trash talk and, and like, friendly trash talk and, you know, walk-up music and all the things that we joke about on Twitter now, this game was doing 20 years ago. And so I think that's, at least for me, why it holds such a nostalgic place in my heart is because while baseball is fun and weird and quirky, the powers that be are trying to do a lot to stamp that out. And that's not what like we really grew up on. Yeah. It bucked this general idea of baseball being very, being a very straight shirt game. You had, you had like superpower pitches that you could throw. Like 
Are you going to see that in MLB The Show where, you know, after a certain number of innings, you get to throw 150 miles per hour once, <laughs> you know, and it eats up half of your stamina? Like, you would never see that because it's like, oh. Actually, you just choose Justin Verlander. Oh, that's actually true. And it doesn't <laughs> matter the inning either. First, ninth. <laughs> um, but yeah, that idea of kind of adding a layer of enjoyment to the game and unrealistic and and opening up that imagination of like, you know, what if. It's why we love Noah Syndergaard as Thor in a bobblehead. That is because of backyard baseball. You know what I mean? That cartoonization of the fun of the game is the reason that backyard baseball endures to me. I hope you know we're finishing this game later tonight. Oh, we absolutely are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, put it in play. Oh, she's beating that out. Oh, beat it out. She's beating that out. Beat it out. Get there. Get there. Get there. <sighs> That's supposed to be fast. <laughs> she's crawling. <laughs> I honestly can't remember whether or not I was engaging with it on that level as a kid. If I was looking into it and being like, uh, this person is definitely a catcher, it's very possible it was just kind of random, but it's it's arguably gotten more fun with time. Like, coming back and playing it and having the opportunity to relive a lot of these memories, I don't know, it... it it's aged like a like a nice wine. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've gone so far, so, so far down memory lane, and we've relived all that nostalgia of a game that we love and is still near and dear to our heart, we just want to say a quick shout out and a thanks to Nick for talking to us for this episode. Thanks to him and everyone else who developed the game in the first place <laughs> to give us even something to talk about and to reminisce over. Yeah, and we obviously have to give a shout out to Zach Cram, who was really the inspiration for this piece. You and I both read that and we were like, man, we got to do an episode about this. We were like, <laughs> like I think it was something that had maybe slipped out of our memories a little bit or just the, the legacy of it. Cause it's very easy for us to just be like, oh yeah, backyard baseball, that was fun. Um, but the idea of doing this deep dive was really unique. And so we will link to that article in the description. As soon as we read the article, we both looked at each other and we were like, we have to do yeah, this. Yeah, we were like, episode. We were like, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Zach, we're stealing this idea from you. <laughs> um, so, no, all credit goes to him in in digging this up and you should definitely go read it. Yeah, and let us know what you think about his article. Let us know what you think about this episode. Let us know if you're having trouble trying to figure out how to play the game yourself. Like we said at the beginning of the episode, there is... Um, some step-by-step instructions on our website for how Alex was able to get it up and running on his Mac. So if you're interested in doing that um, or you just want to let us know what you thought about the episode, feel free to uh, slide in our DMs on Twitter, throw us an email at tippingpitchespod at gmail.com. We're always responsive and, and open to criticisms and questions and comments and that kind of thing. Yeah, and just to set the record straight, you're not going to be getting a such a nicely packaged episode like this every week. Uh, we will be back to our usual goofy selves next week, but we felt this was a nice opportunity to actually take a real in-depth look at something that you and I just both love and is very was very important to us in our formative years. So thanks for tuning in, y'all. Play the game. Yeah, go enjoy play the it. fun of the game. Baseball is supposed to be fun. Yeah, and tell and tell us what you think about the game. Drop into our comments about the players you liked playing with. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, give me some more of that.